Okay, let's get started. Um, good morning from Michigan. So good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, welcome to the Zoominar today. Uh, we have uh, two speakers, Dr. Ranald Melki from CNRS uh, France and uh, Dr. Gunnar Schroeder from Ulich, Germany. And we also have moderators, Dr. Lucy Kemptomorian from uh, Bordeaux, France, and Dr. Lauren Andreas from uh, Göttingen Max Planck Institute um, are the moderators. So Lucy, you can get started to introduce the first speaker. Okay, so I will, uh, good afternoon everyone. I will introduce Ronald Melki. So Ronald is, uh, is a director of research at the CNRS in France. Uh, he first studied during his PhD microtubules dynamics, and then he moved on uh, molecular chaperone mediated folding and since uh, 1999, he's working on prion propagation and on uh, amyloid forming proteins. He chairs several uh, institutes in France, and he was awarded, uh, among others, from the Grand Prize of the French Academy. Uh, his work on Huntington, uh, Tao, and alpha synuclein is well uh, known and well documented. 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 Sorry. <laughs> And I'm sorry, I uh, I could not I will not be able to uh, to sit uh, all of his work, but uh, I I will give you only a few few bullet points, which to me are really important. So his uh, his team generate alpha synuclein aggregates uh, that differ structurally and uh, pathologically, and they were able to establish um, a structural molecular basis from different synucleopathy. His team were also able to amplify pathogenic alpha synuclein and tau aggregates from patient brains and characterize, characterize them in vitro and in vivo. And uh, more recently, uh, and in collaboration with other uh, research group, they were able to map the surface of uh, fibrillar alpha synuclein and tau at uh, atomic resolution to design therapeutics and diagnostic tools. And um, today, his talk will be about alpha synuclein aggregates polymorphism and uh, and distinct nucleopathy. So please, Ronald. Thank you very much, Ulysse, for uh, this nice introduction. And uh, thank you, Hams, and all the team for this really very nice series of, uh, of talks and for inviting me to, to participate. So yeah, indeed, I will be talking mostly about alpha synuclein aggregates polymorphism in distinct synucleinopathies. So to start with, I would like to show you this movie, show essentially to illustrate that alpha synuclein is a dynamic protein. It adopts multiple conformation. This movie comes from a movie we made with Franz Parkinson. It's available on YouTube. Uh, it's simply to illustrate that, you know, the protein adopt multiple conformation. One of these conformation, this hexagon, for example, can interact with uh, molecules in the same conformation. These interactions are transition. They form and dissociate as represented on this movie. And with time, uh, these uh, oligomers, let's put, call them like this, or small fibrils, are taken in charge by molecular chaperones and the proteasome, degraded by the proteasome. Uh, so with time, uh, these, uh, ma this machinery within the cell becomes less and less efficient. And these interaction, you know, occur more and more, more frequently. At the end, you form, you end up with uh, long oligomers or longer fibrils. Uh, and because they are more difficult to degrade uh, with the collapse of the UPS, they accumulate in the cell. They form these inclusions that we call Levy bodies, for example, in the case of Parkinson's disease and which are deleterious to cells and the cells end up disconnecting and eventually dying. Uh, so another way to represent this in a sort of static manner is to uh, is what is represented here. Uh, you have these uh, one molecule that is in a conformation represent, represented here by a cube that can pile up. You have either longitudinal or lateral interaction. When you have both longitudinal and lateral interactions, you form a seed that can grow indefinitely by addition of its constituting uh, molecule. And this is really very, very well explained in this book uh, from two uh, Japanese colleagues, 
I very much recommend you look at this book to you know understand the thermodynamic of polymerization not only of the amyloid proteins but also of you know microtubules for example and in a test tube one can really reproduce what is expected uh, and what I'm describing here with a scheme you have a monomeric form of the protein that form you know sort of oligomers uh, that have sort of an elongated component Later on, you see small fibrils, short fibrils, longer fibrils at steady state. Uh, so why is this happening? Well, essentially, the explanation comes from a very nice uh, series, actually, of, of papers uh, describing life on the edge by Chris Dobson. Uh, and actually, what Chris says and his colleagues say in, in, this, in these reviews is that you know the proteins we uh, produce have evolved to resist aggregation but with no margin of safety and this is why you know under uh, environmental factors and stresses you can you know decrease their solubility so actually what you are doing in this balance between the protein quality control mechanism and protein misfolding is that with time you imbalance this process and you get aggregation uh, what I very much recommend is reading these two reviews here, which I point to from Ulrich Hartel and Rick Morimoto's lab, uh, where uh, the, the, they describe, you know, how the, the, the quality control collapses with time and also, and very important, how aggregation uh, occurs not only with time, but also uh, in a tissue specific uh, manner. Uh, so in other words, what I'm trying to say here is that aggregation uh, of one given protein in a tissue exposed to stress, like, for example, the olfactory bulb or the intestinal wall, uh, uh, occurs at a different speed or with different efficiency as compared to other tissues that are not eventually exposed to stress. So I got interested by, you know, alpha synuclein aggregation and other protein aggregation uh, after, you know, uh, I read uh, two papers from Patrick Brundin and Jeff Cordover describing that uh, fetal graft uh, made in the brain of patients uh, to compensate the loss of dopaminergic neurons uh, contain Levy bodies. And in these two papers published back to back, what, what these two colleagues uh, proposed uh, or suggested is that, you know, these levy bodies from the aged brain could be invading the young graft, which was about 15 years old when uh, at the patient's death, uh, while the old brain was about 80 to 85 years old. And if you uh, make a parallel between this description and what Heiko Brack and, G and Kelly Del Tredici described, in other words, staging of the disease for not only PD, but also MSA and DLB, uh, where they uh, proposed uh, that, you know, pathology occur first in the olfactory bulb and the brainstem, then these regions are more and more affected with time, but also other regions connected within the brain to these regions become affected. Then you, you get to the idea that these aggregates are forming with time, but also propagating within the brain, following defined patterns and pathways. So we made this hypothesis back in 2008 and 9, Ron Copito, Patrick Brundin and I, that these protein aggregates and many others, of course, uh, spread and amplify. In other words, they have prion-like properties. In other, in, in other words, they are infectious. So this is schematized here. So these aggregates form in a cell. Uh, they can be released actively or passively, passively meaning when the cell dies. Uh, they bind to other cells, uh, reach the cytosol, uh, are transported eventually and amplified by recruiting the endogenous protein represented here by these uh, spheres, the green spheres. Uh, and so uh, when you make such an hypothesis, you ask then, you know, what are the consequences of the binding of these fibrils to neuron, their take up, their transport, uh, their multiplication and amplification and 
and also how come that you know one the aggregation of one protein is causing distinct diseases uh, namely parkinson's disease multiple system atrophy and dementia with ladybug so what we first did is look at whether these uh, aggregates that we form in a test tube and that we can label with fluorophore in red here for example bind to neurons and the answer is yes you can see them binding to striatal cortical apocampal neurons whether they are expressing or not alpha synuclein they bind to astrocytes to microglia to pericytes to oligodendrocytes so basically they bind everything uh, Amulia Shrivashtava, a very, very talented postdoc in my lab, next asked what they are binding to in uh, neurons. So he did storm imaging, and you can see here that the fibrils bind to uh, dendrites, to axons. They bind to synapses, both excitatory and inhibitory synapses. Uh, then with Virginie Redeker, uh, he asked, what are they binding to? Uh, so to answer the question, they exposed uh, very briefly neurons or astrocytes to fibrillar alpha-synuclein with a tag. Then they pulled on the tag and identified uh, the protein that binds to, uh, to the fibrils. And what they found is not, unfortunately, one or two proteins, but 178 proteins for neuron. 108 for uh, astrocytes. Some of these proteins are common to both kinds of cells and some are specific to each kind of cell. Well, among these proteins, we have this a protein called the sodium potassium ATPase. This protein is evenly distributed at the surface of neurons. When the neurons are exposed to uh, fibrillar alpha-synuclein, and you have here the clusters of alpha-synuclein, you see clustering of the sodium potassium ATPase, and you have co-localization. At the single molecule level, uh, what Amulia showed is that after labeling a sodium potassium ATPase with a quantum dot, is that the protein move at the surface of the cell until it hit the cluster of uh, alpha synuclein in red, where it gets sequestered. With time, we lose the pumping activity of the sodium potassium ATPase, and as a consequence of not pumping out uh, the, the sodium from the inside of the cell, you, we have waves of calcium entering the cell, which we can measure on human neuron, which this is something we did with Anselm Perrier. You can see here how a network of neuron is sort of oscillating in a calcium oscillation in, in a network of neuron in a control or in a culture where we expose the cells to monomeric alpha synuclein, very similar. But when we expose the, the cells to fibrils, the amplitude remains the same, but the frequency changes. So it's as if the neurons were not interacting, you know, discussing between each other the same way than uh, without the addition of fibrils. Uh, after binding, uh, the fibrils are taken up, and again with uh, Anselm Perrier, uh, we showed using or oriented culture, so we call this a microfluidic culture, where we can orient neurons so that they have their cell body in one uh, sort of area of the culture dish, and their axon uh, uh, that went through a, a micro sort of tube. Um, uh, to the to other part of the of the of the of the culture uh, cell uh, culture dish. So when we add fibrils uh, to the cell body, we saw that the fibrils are taken up. They are transported, as you can see here on this movie, with particles moving in one direction or another, uh, to the distal part of the the culture uh, chamber. And if you have neurons sitting in this distal chamber, you can see the neurons taking up these aggregates. If you do the opposite experiment, where we add the fibrils to the axonal termini, you can see also the fibrils coming up uh, to the cell body of, of the neurons, which axons are sort of uh, uh, sitting in this uh, distal chamber. 
with uh, Michel Braik, we showed that uh, this transport, this anterograde and retrograde uh, transport, is uh, compatible with fast axonal transport. So we believe that these aggregates are bound either within vesicles or outside vesicles to molecular motors, dynenes and kinesines, and they are moving along um, uh, the microtubule uh, network. And to schematize this in a different way, what we believe is that you know these aggregates, when they are forming in a cell, eventually dying or after export from cells, they can bind to the cell body or to the axon and be transported either anterogradely to the axon or retrogradely from the axon to the cell body. Now, uh, so far we are describing, you know, transport, binding and so on and their consequences. But, uh, you know, uh, to be deleterious, these aggregates have to multiply. So with Ed Campbell, uh, who is a specialist of HIV infection and who developed uh, cells expressing galactin-3 fused to cherry FP, we showed that neurons, after they take up fibrils, this time labeled in green, uh, 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 cells that are expressing galactin-3, which is sort of evenly distributed in the cell, uh, when they are taking up, you know, fibrils, uh, the, the, this galactin-3, instead of being evenly distributed, become, you know, punctate in the cell, and these puncta uh, co-localize with the green fluorescence, meaning that actually after takeoff of the fibrils, the fibrils escape the endolysosomal compartment and reach the cytosol. Why can we say this? It's essentially because galactin-3 binds sugars that are exposed at the surface of the cells and also in the lumen of endosomes. And the only way for galactin-3 to sort of cluster in a place is to have, you know, a membrane uh, that is exposed to the cytosol. When they reach the cytosol, these aggregates, this time again labeled in red, uh, recruit the endogenous alpha synuclein, which we can distinguish uh, from the exogenous fibrils, uh, because the endogenous protein after aggregation become phosphorylated. Uh, so uh, when they reach the cytosol, they induce the formation of ladybody-like structure, levineurite-like structures. And you can see here images of what we uh, observed in human cells. When you expose the same human cells to monomeric alpha synuclein, you never observe this. The same is true when you expose these uh, cells to oligomeric alpha synuclein, uh, oligomers that are not fibrillar. Now, multiplication depends on the expression of alpha synuclein. We showed this by exposing different uh, neurons. Uh, to uh, fibrillar alpha synuclein, the same amount of fibrillar alpha synuclein. So you can see that there is no uh, seeding in the cortical neurons ex expressing no alpha synuclein. But uh, when you expose the normal striatal, cortical, or hippocampal neurons to fibrillar alpha synuclein, you see aggregation of endogenous alpha synuclein. And the more the cell express alpha synuclein uh, from the same animal, the more you have aggregation. And this aggregation, and only in cells where aggregation occurred, so multiplication and amplification, we observed in those cells uh, fragmentation and condensation of mitochondria. So uh, the aggregation and, uh, uh, and multiplication of, of these aggregates, as I showed you, are is deleterious, both be, because of the redistribution of important protein at the surface of the membrane, but also because of uh, compromised uh, endolysosomal uh, integrity and compromised mitochondrial integrity. Okay? Uh, these aggregates are cleared, and we showed with Chiara Zozolo that when you uh, fill astrocytes with aggregates and then top them on uh, neurons, uh, there is no spread of or barely any spread of aggregates from astrocytes to neurons. When you do the opposite reaction, you fill the neurons uh, with aggregates and you top on them astrocytes. You do see proper spread and transfer of the aggregates from neurons to astrocytes. And what is really nice is that astrocytes degrade fibrillar alpha synuclein while neurons are unable to degrade alpha synuclein. 
meaning that the spread is or this oriented spread is interesting because it allows you know a neuronal cell to clear up these aggregates uh, what we also showed with uh, Laurent Roibon is that these fibrils are uh, considered by our immune cells in the brain as uh, antigens. Uh, they are taken up and exposed at the surface of astrocytes uh, linked to uh, the MHC2 complex. Uh, and finally, what we showed with uh, uh, Michael Henneke is that the microglia uh, work together to degrade these aggregates. They degrade them, first of all, by just, you know, chopping off the proteins uh, into small pieces, but they also redistribute them uh, between each other so that the cells which are overloaded with aggregates uh, are less overloaded. So they sort of basically send out their aggregates as, as shown here to other cells, uh, for example, through tunneling nanotubes. And what was really interesting is the finding that, in fact, the cells which are doing well, that are getting fibrils from cells that are doing less good, uh, send back mitochondria to these cells that are not doing well, so that they, you know, remain uh, um, and don't die. So this is what I showed you so far is summarized here. Uh, so these fibrils are deleterious because they affect the plasma membrane and the redistribution of important protein at the, uh, at the plasma membrane. These protein injure the endolysosomal compartment, they compromise the mitochondrial integrity and they multiply uh, after uh, reaching the cytosol. Uh, and we believe that uh, in fact their multiplication is affecting lots of processes in the cell leading eventually to uh, cell death. Uh, as I told you from the beginning, uh, alpha synuclein aggregation is associated to several diseases. So, uh, I mean, when I was a student, I used to be taught that, you know, when one protein goes wrong, uh, you have one disease. So here we have one protein going wrong and we have several diseases. So how come? So uh, we made this hypothesis in my lab that, you know, because of the dynamics of alpha synuclein, uh, and the multiple conformation it adopts, which are represented here by these Lego bricks of different color to, to show that they have different surfaces, uh, and which are all in equilibrium to some extent. Uh, you know, uh, we, we made this hypothesis that some of these uh, bricks uh, can interact with uh, similar bricks and uh, form uh, different piles of bricks uh, that have different surfaces and again represented by these piles of of um, of lego bricks um, so this is theory uh, and in reality luc Bousset, under my supervision here in the lab uh, managed by simply revisiting the aggregation of alpha synuclein by changing the experimental conditions you know the ph uh, the temperature, the salt concentration, etc. He managed to uh, obtain many, many, many kinds of fibrils. Uh, we focused on a preparation where we have pure fibrils of one kind. So you can see here a pure prepara preparation of very thin fibrils, uh, larger fibrils observed here in the electron microscope, uh, flat fibrils, twisted fibrils of different twists, uh, which we call fibrils 110, uh, classical fibrils, ribbons, fibrils 91, and 65. Uh, he obtained many other kinds of fibrils, but we are focusing on, you know, pure preparation because we can then relate a structure to a pathology or to a function. Uh, so we characterized thoroughly these aggregates uh, at a time where, you know, we, uh, cryo-electron microscopy was not as uh, powerful as now. Uh, you can see here that these two kinds of fibrils, we, which we call fibrils and ribbons, differ by their proteolytic pattern, meaning that the protease, protein SK here, don't have the same access to, uh, to the polypeptide in this uh, fibrillar form and this fibrillar form. They have different X-ray fiber diffraction, meaning that the protein are not stacked the same way. 
Uh, we have antibodies that recognize both uh, forms, but we have also antibodies from Pulenin Jensen's lab, which recognize this form, but not this form, meaning that the epitope here is, uh, uh, is masked, is not available. Uh, we showed with Ali Maki that they have different physical properties. These fibrils are stiff. These are flexible. And with Anya Bookman and Beat Maya, we did a lot of solid state NMR to show that, in fact, they are both of amyloid nature, very rich in beta strand, but the beta strands are organized differently in the polymorph that we call uh, ribbons uh, as compared to the polymorph that we call fibrils. Virginie Redeker pursued this work and mapped the surfaces of these fibrils using accessibility of proteases. And you can see here that, you know, the proteases do not access, for example, at all, have no access to all the first 100 amino acids of the polymorph fibrils. Uh, and she did also hydrogen deuterium exchange and molecular painting to show that there are regions within these pro within the alpha synuclein that are completely hidden from uh, hydrogen deuterium exchange or uh, modifiers of lysine residues uh, and we we consider that these patterns are like fingerprints for every single polymorph we generated pure of course polymorph we generate we did also some cryo-electron microscopy with, um, uh, with Henning Stalberg, and we saw two structures uh, that are represented here. What is of interest for me is the surfaces of these fibrils. This is why we are looking here at the fibrils on the side. And what you can see here is like a stack of uh, negatively charged amino uh, uh, residues or positively charged as the amino uh, residues. If we replace these blue positively charged residues by thick bars and uh, acidic uh, residues by thin bars, you obtain uh, you know, a, code, a barcode uh, that differ from uh, one polymorph to another. And this is what we are really interested in. These different polymorphs, because of their surfaces, bind differentially to a neuron cultured uh, in, in pet on Petri dishes. So you can see here that some bind very, very efficiently, uh, while others barely bind, and you can quantify all this. And uh, Norwen Ray showed that, in fact, if you inject them in the olfactory bulb of uh, the same model animal, they spread and amplify to different extents. Uh, and with Verle Bakeland, we showed that if you inject to these two sorts of fibrils in the, in the brain, of rats, uh, in both cases you observe the formation of ladybody-like structures, but it's only with the ribbons you observe the formation of inclusion in the oligodendrocyte, which is the signature of, of multiple system atrophy. So uh, what we have been working on uh, is, uh, uh, is showing that the structure of these fibrils uh, is essential for their function, their properties. Uh, and I like to compare these fibrils to pasta because the fibrils uh, look really like spaghetti and the ribbons look like linguine, another kind of uh, pasta made of exactly the small, same molecule, but with a different surface and with different properties. I won't get into comparing the fibrils and uh, the oligomers because we don't have really that much time. I would like to finish by uh, fibrils that we have been amplifying from patients. Uh, so Alexi Feni in my lab uh, uh, implemented a method, uh, uh, you know, inspired from the PMCA method, the protein misfolding cyclic amplification method that was originally designed for PRP amplification in uh, brain homogenate. So here we are amplifying uh, uh, brain homogenate aggregates in the brain homogenate of patients or from the uh, gastrointestinal uh, tract of patients uh, in the presence of pure alpha synuclein generating fibrils uh, and characterizing these fibrils so i won't talk about the structural characterization of these fibrils but i will simply show you that when we amplify 
aggregates from uh, PD, MSA, and DLB patients. Uh, they differ from each other. They look uh, to have more or less the same properties when they are amplified from one kind of disease. So in other words, the fibrils amplified from DPD cases have the same properties, from MSA cases have the same properties, and from different DLB cases have the same properties. When we injected them with valibacillin in the brain of, the, of, um, of rats, what we observed is, again, a differential distribution spread of these aggregates in the brain and different levels of pathology in the, in the brain of the same animal at a given time. Okay? Um, so the objective here now is to, uh, you know, target these aggregates because we think that they are a component of the disease. Uh, so how can we target them? We need to uh, interfere with their interaction with the plasma membrane and the distribution of redistribution of important proteins at the surface of the cells. We need eventually to restore proteostasis so that we clear these aggregates. And we need to protect the endolysosomal compartment and the mitochondria. And the objective here is to displace the onset of disease to later on in life and also slow down the evolution of the disease. So uh, we tried uh, disassembling the fibrils. And actually, it works really well with molecular chaperone and combination, precise combination of molecular chaperones. But very often, you know, this assembly is not complete. We stop somewhere here when, where we generate fragments. And we observe that these fragments are even more deleterious than, you know, the, the long fibrils. So actually, what we are generating, in other words, are bits and pieces of fibrils that have ends that can grow even faster. One other strategy is to, as I showed you, the expression of alpha synuclein is essential for aggregation. What we showed with uh, Georges Tofais is that, you know, when aggregation occurs in a cell, the level of alpha synuclein uh, increases. So it's as if the cell was reacting by overexpressing to some extent by a factor two alpha synuclein. So silencing the expression of alpha synuclein should improve things. But what I believe most into is to use the structure that Gunnar is going to talk about uh, to, uh, to design ligands that bind laterally or on the top, in other words, capping uh, molecules that either change the surfaces of these fibrils and you know, interfere with their binding to cell, keeping the fibrils out of the cells, or bind to the top of these fibrils and interfere with their multiplication and elongation. So we have been working with bits and pieces of the sodium potassium ATPase. Uh, these bits and pieces are the region through which the fibrils interact with, uh, with the sodium potassium ATPase. We have been also working with bits and pieces of HSC70, which we showed to interact with alpha synuclein fibrils and to interfere essentially with the with their, their binding and take up by cells. This is to summarize all I showed you. Uh, again, uh, these fibrils are affecting mostly the membranous uh, components of the cells, both the plasma membrane, the endolysosomes, uh, the mitochondria. Uh, they are uh, stressing the cells in many ways, leading at the end to a disease. And I am convinced that targeting these assemblies based on the structure, and we will hear about uh, this uh, from Guna, will allow us to find therapies uh, for these diseases. I would like to finish by thanking my co-workers, fund by the funding uh, agencies that are supporting us and bodies and charities, and also say that none of what I showed you would have been possible without uh, fantastic collaboration and I'm showing you here uh, a number of names. I would like just to highlight Patrick Brundin, Antoine Triller, uh, but also Anja Bokman, uh, Henning Stalberg, Beat Meyer, and many, many more. Uh, Verle Bakeland, of course. And I would like to thank you for listening. And I hope I didn't go too much over time. Thank you very much, Ronald. Um, please. 
uh, you can uh, post your questions to the Q&A. Uh, we have already one question from Patrick van der Velt. Uh, I'm going to read it to you, Ronald, but you can also read, open your Q&A to see it. Yeah. So Patrick say, great talk and great work. Do you see any correlation between the ability of fibrils to travel between cells and their toxic effect? Or are these distinct separate properties of fibril polymorphs? Yeah, so um, it depends on what you, very, very, very nice thing, uh, question. And thank you for listening to the talk. Uh, um, actually, we need to define toxicity, what we mean by toxicity. Uh, we don't see cell death within the time frame of our experiments. OK, uh, what we do see is that the more you have a traffic transport of these aggregates, uh, the more and which we quantified, uh, the more, uh, you know, we see a redistribution of proteins and so on. But this doesn't mean toxicity, you know. Uh, toxicity for me, at least, means the cell is going to die. It's as if you were adding some, some toxin, you know, to the cell. And uh, see, this is why I avoid using the term toxicity. Um, now, uh, the the the. The traffic is uh, depends to some extent on the on the polymorph, so this is right, and eventually all the consequences depend also on the polymorph. I hope I answered the the question. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, we have an. Uh, I would like also to add that we cheat slightly in our experiment. Very often we fragment the fibrils so that they are uh, sort of about fifty nanometer long compatible with endocytosis. So we force more or less the system to take up the fibrils. But when we don't do this, this is what uh, what I described uh, is, is true. OK, thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Murugesan Velayutan. And uh, the question is, does fibril affect the life of the cells, neuron, astrocyte, or microglia? Yeah, the, so the answer is no. Uh, within the time frame of our experiments, and in particular neurons. Neurons do very, very well with the, with the fibrils and all kinds of fibrils. Okay, the, the next question, uh, I, I, I don't know the name, so I'm sorry, but it's, uh, it's a great talk. Do the linguini and spaghetti you generate in vitro match the in vivo structures of alpha synuclein aggregates in disease? Yeah, so the answer is no. Uh, what we generated does not resemble to what uh, the lab of Michel Godert described so far. Uh, having said this, uh, uh, they, what we, and also what we amplified from patient is different from uh, what we generated de novo, and Gunnar is certainly going to de de develop this. Uh, having said this, uh, you know, again, it depends on the environment of the cell, and one cannot rule out that you have multiple structures in, in other words, multiple strains in the in the brain of patients. Okay. The next question from Pernilla Vitung Staffschede is: When you use amyloid fibrils for spreading, are you sure it is fibers? that spread and not monomer or oligomers. A preparation of alpha-synuclein fibrils would always have some monomers here. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Pernilla is, is, uh, is, uh, is right. What we, I mean, I didn't get time to get into this, but this is described in the papers. So what we do is we sediment the fibrils uh, to get rid of the monomers. And we showed that within the time frame of the experiment, the fibrils do not depolymerize. And this is why we recommend to all our partners when we share fibrils with them not to store the fibrils at four degrees, because we showed that at four degrees, the polymer fibrils, for example, disassemble completely. So you cannot put it on ice. You need to keep it at 30 degrees. Uh, so when we add them to the cells, they remain fibrillar. This we know. And we even showed that, you know, when we add different polymorph to, to cells and look at the properties of the endogenous alpha synuclein that got seeded by these fibrils, 
uh, first of all, what is seeded has the characteristic of amyloid. And the second thing is that they have different properties. So we showed in the past that the, that the ribbons, and I showed you here as well, that the ribbons are more, um, uh, sorry, the fibrils are more resistant to proteinase K than the ribbons. And so what we amplify in the brain of animal uh, upon injection of fibrils or ribbon when we inject fibrils is more resistant than when we inject uh, ribbons and this is several months after injection so in other words the exogenous fibrils are templating what is uh, aggregating within the brain of the animals okay so uh, we have a lot of questions i don't know how, how long still i can read the questions because there is still uh, 15 questions so can i say oh. <laughs> I will. Yeah, I think it's good to go with the next speaker and then reserve the questions for the end. Okay. Okay. And I can try to answer if I can. Yeah, you can normally you are if you want to answer some of them directly, you, you can type it directly on the Q and R. No, it's okay. better to better to wait and then discuss at the end because we need to record them all. Okay, okay. I will Thank do you. this. I stopped sharing my, my screen. Okay, shall I continue? Yes. Then um, it's well. It's been really a pleasure to work together with Gunnar Schroeder over the last few years on some topics related to fibrils. So I'm uh, really happy today to uh, introduce him for his talk in this really nice seminar series. So Gunnar studied physics in the late '90s, both at Göttingen and also spending a year in Cannes in France. Um, he then went on for a PhD in Göttingen, here where I am working today. Um, and at the time, already working together with some NMR guys, uh, Christian Griesinger and, and others from the department that I'm now in, uh, modeling dynamics of proteins. Um, he was in the uh, computational biophysics uh, group with Rubmuller at the time. Uh, he then went for a postdoc in Stanford and became a group leader at uh, Ulich Forschungszentrum, uh, where he remains today. And since 2011, he's been uh, professor um, at the University of Düsseldorf. Um, related to this seminar series, also he's really been there since the beginning with uh, Prairie structures of fibrils. Um, just to highlight the 2017 fibril structures of the beta 1 to 42. And with that, I'll turn the stage over to you, Ben. Looking forward. Yes, uh, which is, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Doran, for the nice introduction. Um, am I sharing my screen? Uh, looks good. We see the desktop in addition to the slides. Like yeah, this? It's fine. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks a lot um, um, for the introduction and uh, Rams and uh, your team. Thanks a lot for uh, having me here today. It's uh, It's a great pleasure. Um, yeah, I will be um, basically continuing uh, what, what Ronald started with the uh, um, structural polymorphism. And I will, in my talk, mostly talk about structures as we have been um, uh, working on uh, uh, determining amyloid fibril structure uh, with cryoEM over the last uh, couple of years. And um, so when I talk about amyloid fibrils, I usually show this as my first slide just to just to set the stage a bit um so you do you see my my pointer here okay um so uh, when we talk about protein folding or misfolding you usually um look at a scheme like this so we have monomers that normally go into um you know fold into a native fold of a protein if it's a globular fold that's kind of the traditional a uh, typical way of functional proteins. Um, but then there are other forms of ag protein aggregation and um, uh, they start aggregating into smaller oligomers and there can be different forms apparently and they're described as some off pathway forms that and, and on pathway towards the, the fibril um, formation that ends up in deposits, amyloid deposits, and, and depending on protein, it's called different, and it could appear different in different places in the, in the body. Um, so we've been looking at mostly at these fibrils, um, 
mostly because they are uh, the easiest to get because they are very organized and um, long and um, symmetric. So um, the structure of those can be determined now relatively easily with, um, with cryoEM. Uh, we also looked at oligomers um, and, and other um, less ordered forms, but of course, you know, these particles are much smaller, they're heterogeneous, it's very difficult to determine the structure. Um, so we continue doing this, and I'm not showing any results on this. Uh, I will talk about virals, um, basically. And as you heard uh, already, um, these virals can uh, um, form very different types of structures, and this is the structural polymorphism that um, Rona just uh, mentioned. And that means that fibro, fibro um, structure depends very critically on, on which aggregation conditions were chosen. So it depends on the buffer, it depends on pH, salts, lipids, and all the other cofactors that are in the, in the soup while the monomer is aggregating. And um, so that also means that kind of the energy landscape for, um, for, for, for fibroids is relatively flat and only small changes um, to the uh, to the environment conditions to, um, um, guides the structure towards different um, polymorphs. And it seems like there's um, um, uh, the structural polymorphism is much more pronounced for all the in vitro preparations um, than for the ex vivo structures that we've seen for, for um, most of the ex vivo structures that were extracted from tissue. Um, there seem to be either just one polymorph or maybe two, but not like five or eight or so, which we sometimes see in uh, in, 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 in vitro preparations. So, um, it, and, and this is this is really nicely shown and, and uh, I'm also using this this example uh, a lot. This is a really impressive paper by um, Charles Scherz and Michel Godard, um, where they really um, scanned many different conditions under which they um, let the uh, tau uh, protein um, form fibrils, and they get a whole zoo of different uh, structures. And I think this is really impressive and shows us very, very nicely how um, how extreme this polymorphism can be for these uh, for these amyloid fibrils. And I, and I and I and this is true probably in in a very similar way for many other uh, amyloids like alpha synuclein or AA beta, even though this. Two to fours has not really been done for um, for the other ones, but we see already several different polymorphs for alpha synuclein, a beta. So I guess the, the story is very similar for for these uh, different proteins. Um, but what they also saw um, is that they are not all completely different. Um, there are de uh, you know details that that are um, quite similar. So there are structural motifs that that can easily be. Um, aligned and superimposed, and they they, they are reoccurring, uh, recurring motifs, and um, and uh, we looked at mostly at um, at a beta and alpha synuclein. So um, if we compare um, our in vitro structure that we solved many years ago uh, with the new ex vivo structures that um, also sh uh, the shares and good at lab um, um, published last year, you see they are in they look different, of course, um, as as in 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 most cases, in vitro preparations look different from ex vivo structures. But there are some motifs that are the same, like this C terminal um, motif, uh, which aligns really almost exactly, and uh, that has been observed in many other a beta structures before. So this is really um, in, uh, a common motif, and um, even in an, in a very weird variant of a beta that we looked at, um, and this is a collaboration together with uh, Martin Ingelson, um, the so-called Uppsala mutation where the a beta sequence is missing six uh, um, residues. So it's a deletion. That means that, I mean, the whole peptide is only 20, uh, the whole peptide was only 42 amino acids and only missing six amino acids. It's it's really a, a strong change in the in the whole, Structure, but still, if you, I mean, in this case, we solved the in vitro structure. Um, you still see exactly the same C terminal motif, which is really well conserved. And um, we are working on the ex vivo structures as well from, from human and from mouse. And um, we, the story is not really finished yet, but we also see this occurring um, C terminal turn. So 
um, even in such a drastically different uh, um, version of of, of a beta, um, you still see the same motive. So that's um, that's interesting, and it's good to um, good good to realize that there are re really um, favoring or favorite uh, um, motives forming. And um, I just superimposed all of these models that I just showed, and just so you see the the how strongly conserved these um, this motive is. And so I'm coming back to this motive in a moment um, because it became also relevant for another story that we worked on and we looked at um, IAPP. So IAPP or also called amylin is a, is a hormone peptide, a um, bit shorter than A-beta, it's a 37 uh, amino acid in length. And um, so we looked at the, the this peptide uh, um, in vitro, those in vitro structures that we determined. So IPP is this produced in the in the pancreatic beta cells. It's co-secreted with insulin. Um, it's involved in maintaining um, your your blood sugar, and the peptide is highly amyloidogenic, so it really forms amyloid fibers very quickly, and um, in uh, in it's related to um, Diabetes, so in type two diabetes, you find um, very typically the um, deposits in the pancreatic um, cells, and um, and that um, it affects the insulin um, secretion. So we um, uh, determined so the structure we found three different polymorphs. One, the first polymorph here is very um, the most dominant one. This is the structure. Um, so this looks like like many other amyloid fiber structures. So you get these stacked sheets, and um, you have two protofilaments. And um, but what was interesting for us was also, um, well, first of all, there's a, a common motif. This is the so-called NNF Gale motif that is um, most important for the aggregation, and it's really necessary for the aggregation. And this is here at the center of the filament. So this is kind of expected because it's known that this, this motif uh, needs to be in the core of the fiber. Um, but if we look at this S-shaped motif here, we found that this looks um, kind of similar to our um, a beta 42 structure. Um, and in fact, there is also a link between diabetes and Alzheimer. That's what I um, want to tell you about a little bit. So, Diabetes patients have almost twofold higher risk of developing um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. And also IAPP and A beta, they co-localize in the um, uh, islet amyloid uh, deposits in um, diabetes patients. And also the other way around, A beta deposits in the brains of A deep uh, patients. So they, they co-localize um, in, the, in, the, in the pancreas and also in the, in, in the brain. And it has been observed that there's mutual cross-seeding of IPP and A-beta observed in transgenic mice. And the, if you align the sequence, um, they're not really the same, but there are some points that make them a bit similar, um, especially also this NN, oh, sorry, this, um, this NNF Gale motif here that appears in a similar, or at least in a, yeah, it's, it's in a similar way also in the A-beta sequence. And um, so we superimposed the, the, the IPP structure onto our in vitro A beta structure. And you see that at least roughly there's a, there's a similarity um, uh, in, the, in the shape. Um, and also two disease related mutations in IPP and A beta, they superimpose in this, in this way here on exactly the same position. So um, there is a, there is, there was this idea that maybe um, the the relationship between diabetes and Alzheimer could be related to the similarity of the structure because they they cross seed each other, and maybe this the similarity in the structure here is is uh, important for this. And when the um, ex vivo structures from um, um, Sjors and Michel came out, uh, we looked at those, and it's interesting that. Um, they are most similar to the IAPP structure in exactly this NNF Gale motif. So they, they superimpose really extremely well. 
So um, this is even more compelling than the comparison with the in vitro structure. So they have a, there's some similarity here in the in the C terminus, but um, the 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 main structural similarities in this and an F gale motif. And um, I could well imagine that this is really relevant for the cross seeding um, properties because this this forms a, a very nice template um, for the for the cross seeding. So um, in the next uh, part of the presentation, I'd like to um, shift towards alpha synuclein and I present a story that we just published. Um, and this is about the interactions of alpha synuclein with lipids. And uh, this is a um, um, very fruitful collaboration um, with the group of Christian Griesinger and also with Lauren Andreas, who's, um, uh, who just talked already about our, um, our collaboration. So this is, those are all people from the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. And um, so we looked at um, alpha synuclein. I don't have to introduce alpha synuclein really because this was done by um, Ona very nicely. Um, so the alpha synuclein um, uh, uh, is also involved in the lipid homeostasis and has been discussed as uh, relevant for the um, uh, for the development of the um, Parkinson's um, uh, pathology. Um, Lewy bodies have been identified to contain not only alpha synuclein fibrils, but also lipids. And uh, the fibrillization of alpha synuclein is very strongly enhanced in the, by the presence of lipid vesicles. So um, it's still unclear whether alpha synuclein aggregates are really responsible for impairing the lipid homeostasis or whether it's the other way around, is it's apparent vesicle trafficking that causes the alpha synuclein aggregation. Um, so it's kind of these two concepts, not clear which are most relevant, the lipid induced, whether it's a lipid induced proteinopathy or whether it's a protein induced lipidopathy. Um, so we, um, we study the interactions of alpha synuclein with lipids um, because we hope that we get um, that this kind of molecular detail of this interaction helps us understanding the role of lipids in, in, uh, in Parkinson's disease. And um, there's not much high resolution detail about these interactions known today. Um, so uh, the whole sample preparation was done in, in Göttingen um, where they uh, um, prepared um, small unilim lamella vesicles, SUVs, of a mixture of POPC and POPA lipids. Um, so we have these, these, um, small, these uh, small vesicles here and then add monomeric alpha synuclein in a lipid to protein ratio of 10 to one, and then um, let the fibers grow. And then we look at the fibers with cryoEM. Um, so this is a negative stain image of these, um, of these fibers in the presence of lipids. And you see already um, I don't know if you can zoom in here. Um, you see the kind of small vesicles that attach to the fibrils. It's uh, kind of nicely visible here. Some are not attached, some are just in solution, but um, many of them are um, attached to the, um, to the fibrils. And um, so this is how this looks like in, in um, cryo-EM. We actually see also in some cases complete vesicles that attach to the to the fibrils, but um, overall there are um, uh, yeah we, okay we solved the structure and we found um, actually six different polymorphs and those are the those are the structures. Um, they are uh, we call them L one and L two and L three because th this is the this is the kind of the the name of the this is how we call the fold so this is the l1 fold and that appears in three different polymorphs depending on the um, different interaction interface between the filaments um so the whole fiber would be l1a l1b and l1c both are uh, all three composed of the l1 fold and then we found um, uh, two uh, polymorphs that contain the L2 fold, and then one that's a slightly different fold, which we call L3 fold. Um, so um, 
let's take a closer look at the L1 fold first. Um, so this is a fold that has never been observed before. So this is um, uh, unique to this to this to the to to this lipid environment in which they uh, form, and um, uh, the resolutions of all these structures is around three angstroms. So it's a um, pretty um, decent resolution to really reliably build the atomic models, and um, the L two folds. Um, they actually look, I thought this is, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so they they are actually quite similar to uh, to in vitro structures that have been described before. So um, this is the polymorph two that um, Ronald also uh, uh, mentioned. This is the this is the paper by Stahlberg, uh, by Henning Stahlberg, um, where they found these two new polymorphs, which consist of the same, Fold, but also different um, uh, filament arrangements. And um, it's actually quite similar, except for um, a register shift in this region here. So there's really just one residue uh, shift um, with respect to each other, these two um, uh, um, strands. Um, it's also similar to the, um, to the E46K uh, mutant structure um, from, from Eisenberg's lab. Um, but yeah, it's in general a bit more di different um, because the, the yeah, structure is just a, uh, not not exactly as similar because also a mutant. So um, when we look at this structure in, in in more detail, but the first thing that we found very weird in the in this in this fibril uh, here is that the individual uh, filaments are really far apart. They're like 20 angstrom apart. And we were a bit puzzled because we thought they're not in contact at all. They can't, there's no real interaction between atoms, uh, between atoms in these, in these filaments. So how can this be, it needs to be really well arranged and, and uh, the structure needs to be really well maintained um, and we thought, how could this happen without any direct interactions? And um, it turns out, if we look at, um, oh no, where's the, where is the, but I'm missing a, oh, oh okay, sorry, I understand. I, I wanted to, I wanted to tell you something else first. Um, the, the first thing I wanted to tell you is that, um, these two polymorphs here, um, they are a bit special because um, the protofilaments in these two fibers have different polarity. That means this, yeah, I, I'll explain this on the next slide, I think. Um, um, in, in, in all amyloid fibers, at least, at least as much as I am aware, um, in all amyloid fibers that have been observed so far, the ends of the fibers are different. So this is an, an example of our A beta 42 um, structure. And so those are the two different ends. Um, we call this the ridge and the groove end because the one is a bit indented and the other one sticks out a little bit. And um, so that means um, that the binding to the different ends is also different. There must be different pathways from the, from, from the monomer to bind to, um, to the fibril end. Um, if the end, uh, if, this, if the if the structure of the end looks different, um, the the pathway is different, and the kinetics could also be possibly different. Um, and that means you get uh, a polarity um, of the fiber growth. And um, so this is just a schematic picture of this. So if the end looks different, then the conformational transition that needs to happen um, is 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 different. So the um, energy barrier could be different, but the delta G of course must be identical because the end product is completely the same yeah? it's, it's identical. So delta G must be the same. And, um, and this has been also shown experimentally. Um, um, I think this is a paper from the um, Kaminsky group uh, where they showed that the fibers actually grow uh, with different speed and um, in, in different directions. So, but if you have, um, as in this case here in our L2 and B and L3A fibrils, um, the polarity is opposite. So once one strand goes up and the other goes down. So that means the, um, the ends are identical. 
And that also means that um, binding is completely symmetric to, to both sides and also the fiber growth will be um, the same in, in both directions. So I found this quite interesting because it's, I, I'm not aware that this has been described before. And this is apparently lipid induced. So um, if we look at the cross sections here in the, with the gray values, we see, um, uh, uh, we see these gray clouds and, um, and we think those are the lipids um, and they're quite nicely seen here and here. Um, and to really to confirm that those are lipids, we started, and this is the work of my, um, um, uh, the whole project is the uh, work of my postdoc Benedict Frick and he um, solved the, these structures and then also um, um, did um, these uh, molecular dynamic simulations and this, so we started from our um, protein fibril model. Um, um, he added the lipids in the in the in the mixture one to one with the, with the same lipid to protein ratio um, as in the um, experiment. Uh, added um, the um, sodium chloride ions and water molecules, and then produced uh, molecular dyna dynamic simulations. And this is one. E one example um, trajectory where you can see how, I hope you can see it um, smoothly enough. Um, we can see how the, how the lipids um, are forming um, like small micelles and then bind to the, um, to the protein surface. And then we analyzed, so this is a um, snapshots of these simulations um, where you see these little micelles, how they, attach and bind to the surface. You also see this is a side view here. This is the fibril axis. You see how they sit on the surface and also crawl into, um, into grooves and, and uh, in, 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 um, uh, into, into the void uh, in, inside the fibril. Um, so we uh, have eight independent simulations, each one microsecond for each of the six polymorphs. So um, quite a lot of uh, simulation. And then um, Benedict calculated a lipid density grids. So we, we produced the density distribution calculated from the MD simulations to show where the um, lipids end up. And, and this helps us to compare um, these results to um, the cryo EM maps. And um, so those are the, the upper row here are um, the density maps we obtain from, from Cryoem, so those are the 3D reconstructions from, from the Cryoem uh, images. And then for comparison, we have these density maps from uh, calculated from the MD simulations. And um, so uh, Benedict has calculated this independently from the different um, species, in, uh, molecules in the, in the um, in compounds in the in simulation. So we have, for example, the choline groups in the, um, for, in the lipid head groups that, that, that very nicely show um, these these curved structures that uh, align really well with the um, observed extra densities in the in the cryoEM maps, and this helps us to um, confirm that those are really um, densities that um, originate from the lipids. And we can zoom in here uh, a bit closer and see um, see really also the tails density for the for the tails of the lipids here, for example, inside the fiber and also here on the surface. Um, like this, and, um, and there are also here these elongated rod-shaped densities that, that we attribute to the tails of the lipids. Um, so we did the same thing also for the, um, for the other polymorphs, so we, we really see exactly the same types of um, lipid distribution as in cryo-EM. And then we can um, actually also model in um, POPA or POPC uh, uh, molecules that roughly fits. And if you look in the side view, you actually see how they stack onto the surface. So they are really well organized and packed on the surface of the fibril. Um, so in the last um, few slides, I would like to um, show new results that we obtained for uh, a beta 40 in a complex with lipids. Um, so this is also uh, um, the collaboration with uh, Christian Griesinger and Lauren Andreas and, uh, and involves also um, Stefan Becker and Muk Jong um, and, and Karin, um, which, uh, who, who um, did all the sample preparation. 
uh, and um, isotope labeling. Um, so this is a combined cryo NMR study, and we uh, will also have um, the detailed uh, studies, NMR studies on the interaction of the lipids with the uh, with the fibers that I'm. Uh, cannot present today, but I will show you um, first results from the from the cryo EM. Um, so those are the micrographs of a beta forty in, in, together with the lipids. So you see, and this is this is now DMPG lipids. Um, they form these uh, bicell structures. Uh, you see some um, some are also attached to the um, to the fibrils. Um, so this just gives you a um, rough idea of how the sample looks like. Um, this, uh, th those are some 2D class averages um, from these fibers, and you see that some uh, you, uh, where you see these these this um, cross beta pattern. This is the 4.7 angstrom um, pattern that comes from the cross beta, and then there's other density outside here that is more smeared out that doesn't have this 4.7 angstrom pattern, and this is uh, this comes from the lipids. Um, and if we solve the structure, uh, we again see six different polymorphs, um, it, it, very different structures. Also, um, some really exotic structures, I think, and especially these ones here look um, really strange. And also, again, we have uh, polymorphs where the fiber or the filaments are uh, far apart. And um, this makes a bit more sense when we look at again at the cross-section densities. And this looks even more clean than the uh, than the alpha nuclein case. I think this is really beautiful way how you can see the, um, the, the lipid structures around the, um, the fiber. Um, like in, in all cases, you see very nicely um, the, these um, circular densities. And also in many cases, you can start seeing um, the at the tails already in the uh, in this cross section density. Or here you see these these stripes. Those are um, already like densities for the um, for the tails. So this is really nice. So this is really nice. The L1 um, structure is the most uh, by far the most dominant one. It has the highest population, and the other ones are much less uh, populated. And this also correlates with the resolution that we obtain. So we the, the best one here is 2.9 and the, the lowest population is a 3.9. So these are really low populated, these, these two ones. And we again see um, like this, what we call L2 and L3 fold, they are slightly different. Um, um, here they have, a, they have a kink at a slightly different side. So they look similar at first, they have the same C-terminal uh, turn that we have seen in the other structures as well. And then they, they extend a little bit different here. There's some, some subtle differences. Um, and this one's actually a mixture of the L1, L2 and L3 fold uh, form this really weird fiber that is stabilized by the, um, by the lipids. So in the first, the L1 uh, fold, um, it was really interesting because uh, of course we have seen this before. This is the same structure that um, Rob Tickle published um, a few years ago. Uh, this is an A beta 40 structure that he, uh, they produced um, by amplification um, of, um, of brain material with A beta 40. As a, also very high resolution structure that they published, but they didn't have any lipids there. So what they observe instead um, is additional density here, uh, which looks like protein or some peptide density. So it has the same pattern. The, the shape appears like that. And they interpret this additional density as, as an additional A beta 40 uh, monomer or subunit that sits on the surface and actually spans two layers. Um, and um, so it makes sense that there is something else because this site uh, is, is very hydrophobic. So it must be, must be covered by something to stabilize the fold. In our case, this is exactly where we see very strong and nicely ordered lipid densities. And we see additional, um, additional lipids uh, on here. So um, we think this is very interesting that, that we can uh, find this exactly the same fold. And this is really is almost identical up to 
Um, so here's the uh, the C terminus, the um, the forty position, and then it wraps around. In our case, the the the, the chain wraps around here. Tyrosine ten um, uh, packs the 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 C terminus a little bit, uh, which is different in uh, in this structure here. But otherwise, the the core here is exactly the same. Um, yeah. Then let me summarize. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but um, so I've showed you. Uh, several structures of alpha nuclein a beta that are complex with lipids. So we see the very detailed interactions of the fibers with the lipids. Um, we see new protofilament folds that, that are stabilized by um, by uh, by lipids by intra protofilament interactions. We also see new arrangements of, of protofilaments that are stabilized by uh, lipids and um, we also see that these these fibers take up a lot of or a substantial amount of lipids, so they really um, extract lipids from the from the liposomes that were or vesicles that were um, pr uh, present in the in the in the initial solution, and they um, disrupt these uh, these membranes and take up um, a large amount of of lipids. So they 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 cover the uh, not only the surface but also in some cases the interior of the fibrils um, with lipids. So we think this. Um, this helps maybe understand how how alpha nuclein and a beta interact with membranes and um, how fibril growth uh, could start at the membrane surface and how um, they also can destabilize membranes uh, during fibril growth. So that was um, all I wanted to show. Um, I'm thanking my group members and all our collaborators in Düsseldorf and Jülich and in and, and Göttingen, of course, with, uh, it's, it's a great collaboration. I thank uh, Martin Ingelsson for a very good um, collaboration and um, uh, our colleagues in, in Maastricht, where we have a close collaboration with them and um, Alzheimer Forschung Initiative for funding and other sources for funding. And thank you very much for, uh, for listening. Great, thanks. So as with the last talk, please, type in your questions in the Q&A box and I will go ahead and read out. Um, the first few are already coming in. So Moses Milchberg would like to, to know, so he says, a lipid to protein ratio of five to one, which was used in lipidic uh, fibril structures is very small. While it's definitely more amenable to solving high resolution cryo-EM, might such a small amount of lipid vesicles bias the structures? Uh, well, we had, a, I thought we had a 10 to 1. Uh, didn't we have a yeah, so I can one? comment on that. We, we yeah. use both 5 and 10 to 1 um, for different experiments. And we'd have to, I would have to check the paper to know exactly which was used for which data set. Um, and between those, there was not a huge difference. So, of course, there's also the, um, the difference between using PMCA or shaking or quiescence. Yeah. So okay. I, I don't know if you want to add some more, but uh, from the cryo perspective of whether this helps with the resolution in the cryo I, Well, I think they are they are already uh, quite covered with uh, with lipids. So um, I don't think it would hurt to have a bit more because the, the at, le at, at least on the in the in the in the alpha synuclein case, the, the the fiber core is relatively large, so that's for for image alignment. I think this would be fine if there's still a bit more density of lipids outside, and uh, I think that would not be a problem. And in the alpha synuclein, in the a beta case, I think we even have more coverage of of lipids on the surface because we have this density appears stronger and really well defined. So. I, I would think this is it wouldn't get that much stronger if you if you add more lipids to it. It's probably already quite saturated. Okay, so the next one is from Jan Fichu. It says, "Great talk. Do you know the nature of the lipid protein interactions in your structure? Are they purely hydrophobic?" Um, well, no, not pure. We see um, the. As you expect, you see the the the, the tails uh, are in, in in the hydrophobic patches on the surface, and the and the head groups um, get some polar interactions. So this is pretty much what you would expect. Um, yeah. So Suba Rao says, keeping in mind the role of lipids in the evaluation of um, or evolution? evolution of amyloid proteins, can you please comment on the effect of PEG in the evolution of LLPS through? Though PEG not exactly being a lipid, 
can the hydrophobic hydrophilic nature of peg change or affect the structure uh uh i assume lps there is liquid liquid phase separation, phase separation yeah but I, or other crowders in the in the process but i uh the amount of lipids in the evolution no i don't think i can really comment on that what is the effect of pack in the evolution of the lps i don't think i have a good answer for that if, if someone else has a good answer then so maybe we can continue discussing later if, if yeah. it was uh, so Ashutosh Tiwari says, it's very nice talk. Do lipid concentrations affect the aggregate structure? Yeah, so as you just said, I, I, um, we haven't really tested this um, extremely, but the, but the variations that we had in our experiments, we don't see that. Uh, I mean, although we, of course, varied also other things, uh, um, like the shaking times and stuff like this. Um, that was that that was more important i think for for um driving different populations of polymorphs than than the lipid concentration but but yeah i'm yeah I mean, yeah so in um, cases i guess that they, they, they would have an effect if you lose very very small concentrations then at some point you would see an effect but um, yeah exactly we haven't really explored that parameter space too widely um mm. so muruga san Vilayutham would like to know about the role of lipid fibril interaction in atherosclerotic uh, plaque formation. I don't think I can I can comment on that. That's, that's so I cannot yeah. either. So let's go on to Patrick Vandervel says in some of your alpha synuclein structures you showed missing residues or segments. Are those totally missing in your Coulomb density map, or are they visible as more blurry density? Or are they too flexible disordered to see? Uh, well, all of this is true, I guess. If, I mean, normally we, if, if the 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 pieces that we cannot model um, the, are those that where there's not nothing, no density seen, and that means they are they are flexible and disordered, and that that results in blurry density. So um, I think all of this would be. Would be true. So um, the density is blurry. We can't build a model, and so if you show a model that is where pieces are missing, then um, then that region is 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 too um, too blurry. Like for example, um, um, that was the case. Uh, that's here, for example, the case. Uh, this this connection. This is the. This was also in, in Henning Stahlberg's uh, um, structure. This is just missing because this there's a long flexible loop that's that's that doesn't show up in the density, so we just don't model anything. But of course, the, the connection is there, but it's we don't know how it looks like. It's just flexible. Okay, then the final question I see right now from Muruga-san again: Does lipid restrict the length of fibril formation? The length. The length of the fibrils, yeah, or the, yeah. Um, I I wouldn't know why it would restrict the length. I mean, it's it if at if it it would it would just help to stabilize the 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 fibrils, um, at least in the in the the specific polymorphs that we are seeing. So I would I don't think they they um, restrict the length. They 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 are very long. The fibrils that we are seeing are very long. Yeah, so um, I can comment a little bit. So Life Engelschmidt, who was the graduate student, did optimize for for length by varying mostly the the um, amount of time under PMCA. So from what we did to optimize for the cryoium, I think it was mainly the availability of monomer and, the, and whether there's a lot of PMCA to break apart fibrils. Um, but we don't really know whether the lipid is um, playing a role kinetically. Now, one more question actually arrived in the meantime. So Aphrodite Kapoor Neo2 says, are the lipid treated fibrils of alpha-synuclein able to seed alpha-synuclein fibril formation similar to non-lipid treated ones? Uh, I mean, th that's what that's what you're doing to produce them, right? So you, so you um, uh, these, to use these, also for the, I mean, they seed also the fiber formation of 
the same type of fibers, but I'm not sure if that's the question, but the, um, or, or do you mean, if you take these polymorphs, the, the lipidic fibers and try to, to, to seed non-lipidic, uh, uh, yeah, so there are, I'm also not sure of the question um, in more detail. Uh, I mean, I think that it's been shown in general that the conditions that are used for seeding are also quite important in whether or not the seed is propagated, right? Mm. Mm. But, yeah, but I would guess if you, I mean, if you if you use these fibers and um, use them as seeds for making new types of these fibers in the same in the same environment with, with lipids present, um, you would produce the same the same fibers again um, because that's how they how they grew anyway in the first place. Um, but I don't know about like cross seeding behavior of these fibers with with fibers that that would normally grow in other in in, in other conditions. So um, that we haven't really looked at. Yes. Okay, so that concludes. Yes, there is time. Uh, I, I think I should, I mean, I tried to answer a number of questions, but uh, if there is time, uh, I would like to answer some of the questions that remain uh, unanswered. Uh, so, uh, for example, Pernia uh, writes, uh, have you ever tested if copper ion induce a different polymorph? We didn't try copper, but we did try calcium. So, for example, there are two ways, and this is something I answered already, to generate the polymorph ribbons. So either you work at very low uh, salt concentration or you work under exactly the same concentration than fibrils, but you have calcium in the solution. So uh, ions can drive the aggregation in one direction or another. So I, I interpret this as uh, allowing to populate uh, folding, uh, you know, intermediates of alpha synuclein and stabilizing them. Uh, there was another question from Suba Hao. Uh, uh, he or she was asking on how we fragment the fibrils and how we ensure that they are 50 nanometer long. Um, so we this this is described in the material of and method of most of our recent papers. And we ensure that they are 50 nanometer long, both by electron microscopy, negative staining, but also uh, by uh, analytical ultracentrifugation. So we measure their molecular weight, basically, apparent molecular weight. Um, then Srijit uh, asks, how do you determine the how do you determine the homogeneity of fibril sample uh, from only TEM? Is this foolproof? Uh, the answer is yes, we do use uh, transmission electron microscopy and you do see differences uh, in tra by transmission electron microscopy at the resolution we have. But we also do a lot uh, limited proteolysis and uh, in several papers we showed that the limited proteolytic patterns of fibrils, ribbons, fibrils 91 and so on are very different, It'll allow you to really distinguish. And when there is a mix, you see also that you have a mixture. Um, do you want me to continue? Will you have time or no? I think so, yes, you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, Moses uh, Milchberg uh, asks, have you explored whether slight changes in the Sarkozyl extraction of alpha synuclein from patient tissue and sonication of fibril contribute to polymorphism? We did not. Uh, we never extracted uh, the fibrils. What I showed you when I mentioned, you know, seeding, uh, we, we prefer not to extract anything because indeed extraction can trigger conformational changes. Uh, uh, centrifugation can do it this, uh, also. So what we do is essentially produce a homogenate of the brain of any tissue and use it as is, as, uh, uh, as a seeding agent, basically. Um, Yan Fishu uh, says, 
When you propagate brain extracted fibrils in vitro, how does the propagated structure depend on the buffer condition compared to the structure of the seeds? So uh, uh, we have one defined uh, buffer condition uh, for the PMCA experiment. We always use exactly the same condition. And so, um, so when we even amplify de novo assembled fibril, like for example, fibrils and ribbons uh, by PMCA, we also use this uh, precise condition. So, um, and under this condition, within the time frame that we use for amplification, we do not see the aggregation of alpha synuclein. I need to mention that to be very stringent, we do amplification over four different cycles. So in the first cycle, we stop the reaction as soon as you know we have we are starting to see aggregation using thioflavin T. Um, uh, and then in the second cycle, we leave the reaction longer, and the third cycle longer, etc. Uh, and all this is shown in the papers, so uh, I, I encourage you to, to look at the papers, and it's exactly the same experimental conditions. Um, um, then Chorches uh, asks, uh, it is interesting that different alpha synuclein strain made in vitro yield different uh, patterns of spreading in animal brain. So this is what we observe, thank you. As the structure of these in vitro filaments may be different from those in human disease, uh, could you comment on how you extrapolate the result of these experiments to human disease? Uh, we are not extrapolating, we are simply observing that different... So uh, actually, you know, we did all these experiments to demonstrate that different structure and different surfaces uh, yield different diseases or different pathology or pattern or whatever name it whatever as you wish in one given model animal so and i think we did prove this uh, whether this relates to uh, to human disease is something different and another question uh, but what we are showing and I think it is not unreasonable to consider exactly the same thing, and this is something you, by the way, showed, Charles, uh, is that different polymorph within the brain of patients, in particular tau, for example, uh, tauopathy, uh, trigger different diseases. And potentially, uh, one possibility is that because of their different surfaces, they are either cleared with different efficiencies, they either target different cells within our central nervous system because of the receptors they have at the surface. And as I showed you, and we are working on this, uh, these different polymorphs have different receptors at the surface of cells. So they can target different cell populations within our brain. Uh, Louise uh, Serpel, uh, uh, right, you talked about alpha synuclein fibrils escaping the lysosome. Did you look directly at lysosomal function? and whether this is affected during this process. Uh, the answer is we did not look directly at lysosomal function, but we did show that they reach the lysosome for uh, most of them, and that they, um, uh, that, and, we, and we can modulate uh, uh, the efficiency with which they reach the lysosome with, uh, with drugs, you know, that people, used to play with the lysosome and, and those lysosomal, um, you know, uh, trafficking. Uh, Ashutosh writes, uh, have you identified a unique physicochemical property such as hydrophobicity in addition to a unique structure of aggregate that correlate with toxicity? And again, here I would like to point out that we do not find the fibrils to be really toxic for neurons. I mean, neurons survive for weeks, if not months, when there are neuronal uh, cell of uh, neuron cells, uh, neurons from human uh, iPS cells derived from human iPS cells. Uh, so uh, I don't know if we can call this toxicity uh, within the time frame we are looking at the cells. So maybe if we could wait longer, they would end up dying. Uh, we did not look at hydrophobicity, 
Uh, Gunnar certainly can say something about hydrophobicity and either tropism or uh, toxicity. I don't know, uh, Gunnar, what you think about the role of hydrophobicity uh, uh, in the interaction of these different polymorphs with, uh, with, uh, with cells. Have you explored this or? Well, I, I mean, we, we see clearly, um, especially in the case of the lipids, where that, that they attract that all these hydrophobic surfaces attract, attract these lipids and uh, arrange the lipids in a specific way. And also um, it, but of course that's, uh, that depends a bit on, um, on, on, um, on how the polymer forms in the first place, because the ones, it, it, it depends on in which environment, whether it's uh, already aggregated close to a membrane or in the lipid environment or in some hydrophobic environment, this will induce different polymorphs than, than uh, aggregating in a, in a more polar environment. And, um, and then I could imagine that, of course, these fibers that were formed in, in certain way and have a lot of hydrophobic surface patches, they interact very differently with, with the environment and stick somewhere where others, other polymorphs would not stick or go or penetrate membranes uh, in a very different way than, than, than uh, fibers that have very polar surfaces. Also, yeah, I think this will make a, a big difference in the properties. And so I apologize, but I did answer, you know, technical issues that, uh, that we raised. So, uh, Sorry, I won't bring this up here again, but we have at least two additional questions for mostly you, Gunnar, from Olga and uh, Nuhu Gezan. Okay. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so the role of APOE. Oh, APOE. And, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, we have looked at APOE or interactions with APOE, so I'm, I, I can't really say much about this. I mean, it, it's... It might be, I mean, of course, it might be interesting to to look at these interactions with APOE with these lipidic fibers because they cover a lot of lipids on the surface. And um, but yeah, I can't can't probably no, I can't really say anything because of, I don't I don't know about the role of APOE in these lipid fiber interactions. And uh, and the, the other questions about APS is APS. Do you mean lipopolysaccharides or what do you mean? What was APS? I guess so, because this uh, follows up with an infection model, which would make sense for bacteria. Ah, okay. Um, uh, the, um, mm, ah, probably, I can't really comment on interactions with APS. We haven't looked at that at all. It might be interesting to think about it, but... Um, I mean, I in the know, literature, know. what I notice is that some people get the fibrils inside the cell in infectious model using lipofectamine. Uh -huh, so okay. this way, you know, you encapsulate the fibrils in a lipofectamine and deliver it directly to the to the to the cytosol. Uh, what uh, is important in these infection models and also in the propagation models uh, are, uh, um, you know. It's very important to to um, uh, not to have you know bacterial proteins and bacterial factors that co-purify with alpha synuclein mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise you can induce uh, inflammation, for example. Uh, so uh, uh, you need to, for example, measure endotoxin levels in your preparation and so on. If you don't, or if you buy your alpha synuclein, you may get some. Uh, endotoxins uh, with the preparation. Um, mm. I think we answered all questions. I mean, um, uh, I there, there was one question that. about the TM, right? There was a TM question and whether this is, um, did we answer this one? Let me see uh, if I can find it. It was one. about whether the TM is useful as a screening step or something like this. Or to, to distinguish different different polymers, or was that the question? Yeah, and I answered this question. I said oh, okay. that EM is important uh, and helpful, uh, including at low, relatively low resolution, because I mean, you know, the images I showed you of what I call spaghetti linguine, etc., is based on TM. Uh, but uh, uh, what we very very often do, if not 
constantly do to make sure of the purity of a preparation and homogeneity is limited proteolysis because then you have a pattern that is really specific for every single polymorph you generate. And this is true when the polymorph is pure. When you have mixtures that are very interesting, I'm not saying that the mixture are not interesting, it's simply that when you have a mix, you cannot attribute a function to one component of the mix. So we went for the easy way, you know, in a way, and we work on these five polymorphs because it's easy to attribute a function to a structure, okay? Or, a you know, or establish a relationship between a structure and function. But when you have a mix, uh, it's impossible because you could have uh, something representing 10% of the particle that is very deleterious, while 90% is not. Yeah, so I apologize. I thought that was for Gunnar. And uh, I would just add from the NMR biased perspective that um, the NMR can also be fairly quantitative about this, especially when there's uh, maybe um, overlapping or bundles of fibrils that are more difficult to interpret on the EM. That the, uh, that, so for example, with the work that, that Gunnar showed, the difference between the L1 and L2 types is quite clear. Of course, the arrangement of the filaments, that's something that NMR is not very, very uh, sensitive to. Yeah. And, and in our case, I showed you also that uh, solid state NMR can distinguish, you know, different uh, polymorph. And when you have a mix, you can see the sort of mixed pattern. So yeah, solid NMR is definitely very powerful. Uh, now it's more, it's, it's time consuming and it requests a lot of material compared to limited proteolysis, for example, or TEM. Yes, yes, and isotope labeling. Exactly, not to, to mention this, yeah. Hopefully the ultra-fast spinning would uh, overcome these difficulties. Definitely, and you know, in the last, uh, th thank you, thank you so much for Rams for pointing this out, the size of the rotor decreased by a factor 10, uh, the labeling uh, efficiency is, uh, is increasing, uh, the price of the isotope went down and so on for glucose, for, you know, uh, nitrogen. So, yeah. yeah well, hopefully the one microliter rotor and uh, no need for labeling, only proton, only base experiments can solve all the structures. Let's hope for that. <laughs> Great talks, uh, Gunnar and Ronald. Thank you so much. It's superb stuff. Uh, really, we yeah. all enjoyed it. So, obviously, the questions come directly from the audience because of this great stuff great quality thank you very much for sharing this thank stuff. you thank you lauren thank you lucy thank you. um thank you all. bye thank you thank you Daniel. happy bye. new year to everyone bye. thank you bye bye bye, bye. Happy new year.